Hey, good morning. That was good. That was well done. <laughs> Clearly, we're still going through our Revelation series, or this is going to be an awkward sermon. Um, so we've, we've been walking through the series of Revelation, and the way we've been looking at it has been looking at it through the lens of a fairy tale, but a fairy tale that's come true. The reason why we're doing this is because if you read Revelation, most of it seems crazy. Out of its mind, crazy, ridiculous, right? So the first week we talked about the damsel in distress. That's the church. The church is persecuted, under attack, under pressure. Second week we talked about the hero who's coming to rescue, and the hero is Jesus. Very good. And then this week we're talking about the villain. We're talking about the bad guy. And this is very popular to do in movies right now, right? You've got, uh, I think it started with Wicked, when you kind of looked at the Wizard of Oz from like the w Wicked Witch of the West's perspective. You've got the Maleficent. That's how you pronounce her name, right? Maleficent. Maleficent, um, Angelina, jo Angelina Jolie's movies, where she, you're looking at the Sleeping Beauty story from her perspective. So today we're going to look at the story of Scripture, the story of the gospel, but on a higher level, on a level kind of peeling back the curtain and seeing what's going on behind the scenes, right? And one of the things in fairy tale stories, good fairy tale stories have good villains, and the good villains always have some kind of weapon, some kind of power, some kind of thing that's going to undermine the heroes or be bad for the people that the hero cares about, right? In Star Wars, it's the Death Star, right? It's indestructible. You can't defeat it unless you put a torpedo in a certain spot, right? It's indestructible. Can't be beat. In Lord of the Rings, it's the One Ring. And if the One Ring gets you re reunited with Sauron, what happens? It's all over. Undefeatable, right? Indefeatable. Undefeated. And in so many stories, it's like this. Again, even the stories that are simple, like Rumpelstiltskin. He's unbeatable because who's going to guess Rumpelstiltskin is a name? <laughs> now, I don't know about you, and I don't know what you're facing today, but we're all facing things in our lives that seem insurmountable. That maybe you feel like you can't beat it. Maybe you bought into a lie that life was going to be better if you followed the script that everybody has, and you've gotten the script and you're like, I don't, I don't have half the things that I'm supposed to have. And you feel, you've bought this lie and you feel unhappy and you feel depressed because of it. And you feel like your life's totally out of whack because you didn't take a right when you should have taken a left. And so you feel like the enemy just has his hooks in you. Or maybe you're stuck in some kind of sin. And every time you fall to the sin, there's accusation and, and oppression just comes upon you and you just, just feel so defeated all the time. And you feel like God is just angry with you all the time. Or maybe you've actually gotten everything you've ever wanted. And you look at it and you think, this has got to be something more. Today we're going to look at the enemy. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 12. And we're really going to look at it as an unholy trinity. There's three, and there's, there's an enemy, and then he has minions, because every good villain has minions, right? He has minions, and we're going to look at this as an unholy trinity. And we're going to see how we might defend ourselves from these attacks. So let's look at the weapons that our enemy has and how he uses them. And the first thing we need to do is we don't need to be burned. Don't be burned. I'm going to walk you through Revelation 12, 1 through 6, because it's kind of crazy. And a great, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and on her head was a crown of 12 stars. Now, this is most likely uh, the people of God. So as the story progresses, the people of God will be the church, but at this point, it's probably just Israel, okay? So we're talking about Israel right here. Notice the 12 stars, the 12 tribes of Israel, and she was pregnant. And she's crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. These are the trials, the tribulations of Israel, the taking of the land, the being exiled out of the land. All these things that happened in Israel or the people of God's history, these are the birth pains. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon. And this is Satan, right? With seven heads and ten horns and on his tail, or sorry, on his, yeah, seven heads and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Who's the child? The Messiah. The promised one who's going to overturn the curse in Genesis 3. Remember? Genesis 3, there's a serpent, there's a dragon there who leads all humanity into death and destruction. And so now Satan, to complete his victory over God's people, he's going to stand and he's going to destroy this, this heir, this, this person who's going to overturn death sin and evil. And he tries to do it. If you go, if you, and we'll read about it in, in, in the coming months, Bethlehem, 
What does King Herod do? Slaughters all the male children. Why? Because he's afraid of being supplanted by a king of the Jews. But really behind that is the dragon. Satan manipulating Herod so that he can kill the male child. But she gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. So this being taken up into heaven, this is the resurrection. Satan wins. It looks like he kills the Messiah, finally kills the Messiah. But because the Messiah is sinless, because he's perfect, because he died unjustly, God raises him to life. And now death has been defeated. We just read about that. We sang about that. And so when this happens, a war breaks out in heaven. Look at verse 7. Now war arose in heaven, and Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. Michael, uh, in Jewish literature, is seen as the, the patron defender, the guardian angel of Israel. And Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, the dragon, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who's called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So this is kind of like a meanwhile. So when Jesus gets resurrected, meanwhile, when that happens, that's like Michael's signal to be like, all right, game on, let's attack. Let's kick him out of heaven. Because if you remember in the movie Lord of the Rings or in the book Lord of the Rings, uh, Aragorn and all the people are standing outside the gates of Mordor. Yeah, I'm a big nerd. And, and they're fighting and they're about to lose. And then what happens? Frodo destroys the ring. And then all of a sudden the powers of darkness, they become beatable, right? And the eagles show up. That's the end of it. This is what happens. Michael can have victory, not because Michael's stronger than Satan. I don't know if he is or isn't. But Satan's power, Satan's hold is broken. And so Michael can have victory. Now notice how the dragon is described. He's called the devil and Satan, which Satan's a title. It's not a name. It means the accuser. And he's the deceiver of the whole world. He's an accuser and he's a deceiver. So I read one commentary that said, don't look at this necessarily as like an actual war going on. Look at it more as a courtroom scene, which, unless you're a lawyer, seemed a lot duller than a war to me, but let's go with it. Imagine Satan, the accuser, standing before the throne of God, and as Old Testament saints come in before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, imagine Satan standing there and being like, why are you letting him in? He's a sinner. I don't care if you declared him righteous by faith. It doesn't matter. He's done things. He deserves to be punished. God, you are unjust if you allow this person to spend eternity with you. And Abraham goes in, and Isaac goes in, and David goes in. And again, sin has not been atoned for. Yes, they've made sacrifices, but ultimately, they're still sinners. They're full of original sin. And Satan is the prosecutor. And what's terrible about this is that Satan is actually right. He's right. If God just overlooks sin, he's unjust. And so Satan is manipulating God, trying to manipulate God, into convincing God to destroy his own people. God, you have to destroy them because they're evil and sinners. And yes, I led them into that by deceiving them, but that's beside the point. They still did it. This is until Jesus' resurrection. Now, for all of God's people, all who are saved by faith, now that all of us who live after the cross and those uh, Old Testament saints who are declared righteous by faith, the accusation can't stand. Again, imagine the courtroom scene. Accusation, accusation, accusation. And then Jesus throws the doors open of the courtroom. He says, I have evidence for the defense. Exhibit A, my head crushed with thorns. Exhibit B, my hands pierced with nails. Exhibit C, my side pierced by a spear. Exhibit D, my feet pierced by nails. Exhibit E, an empty tomb. And for all of us who look at the evidence, those exhibits, the evidence of Jesus Christ paid for uh, our sins, if we apply that evidence to our own case, our own trial, and say, Lord, I don't have a defense except for the evidence that you provided by Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we are forgiven. And our case is thrown out. Satan is thrown out of heaven because his lawsuit is frivolous. It can't stand anymore. And so he's chucked out of heaven. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. None. Satan is the one who's thrown out instead of the people of God. 
Michael's kind of like a bailiff. He throws him out of the case, out of the court. And so the fire of the dragon, because all good dragons breathe fire, right? It's accusation it's, and it's deceit. It's accusation. And you don't have to be burned by it anymore. You don't have to feel guilty anymore. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you've applied the evidence of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to your life, and you put all your case, your entire defense is rooted on that piece of evidence, the person and work of Jesus Christ, you're forgiven. You don't have to feel guilty anymore. You don't have to be ashamed anymore. That is just the fire of the dragon. That is not conviction of the Lord. Yes, we should try to stop sinning. Yes, we should listen to the Lord when he brings conviction in our life. But that is different than guilt and shame. Conviction from God will drive us to him. Shame drives us away from him. Make us feel like we can't be around him. And if you don't believe me, let's go back to the text. Verse 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven. Now, this is not God speaking. These are the saints. These are the Old Testament saints. These are all the saints who have gone before us saying, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of who? Our brothers and our sisters has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice. You can't get burned by the fire anymore. Now you can still feel the heat, but you can't get burned anymore. And this is what 12.12 says. So look back at 12.12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. So where do we live? Are we in heaven or are we on earth? Okay, so it says woe to us. Why woe to us? Well, when you, those who are in heaven, they, they, they don't feel the accusation anymore. They don't feel the guilt and shame. They don't feel the heat of the fire of the dragon. But we do. Because we live in a fallen world and we're still susceptible to these feelings of guilt and shame. So how do we not get burned? There's this great passage in Ephesians 6 where you put on the full armor of God. And Ephesians 6.16 says, Take up the shield of faith with which you are able to extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. The flaming darts. What are the flaming darts? Accusation and deceit. You're not worthy. God doesn't love you. He's disgusted with you. He doesn't want anything to do with you. I don't care if you put your faith in him. You are the worst, and he wants nothing to do with you. And you raise the shield of faith, and you say, no, 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 no. I've put my trust in Jesus Christ, and those darts bounce right off, and they're extinguished. So what does this look like? How do you raise the shield of faith? Well, notice what it says in verse 11. Conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. The blood of the lamb. We need to remember again and again and again and again and again and again and again why we have right standing before the Lord. If you get tired of hearing the gospel story again and again and again, well, you shouldn't. Because it is the one thing. It's the, it's the way we raise our faith. We trust the Lord. We trust the sacrifice of Christ. And we remind ourselves again and again and again. Martin Luther, when he would feel uh, guilty and ashamed, and uh, he, would, he would actually scream out like they would hear him, but I am baptized! And it would be that loud. Maybe he wasn't mic'd up, but I don't think he needed to be. <laughs> and for, for, for Luther and, 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 and his tradition at that time, like, baptize, baptism and, and salvation, those went hand in hand for him. And he was saying, the blood of Christ covers me. Then you stay faithful. The word of your testimony. They loved the Lord, even unto death. That doesn't mean all of them died, but it means that whatever was tempted, whatever offered to you, whatever empirical evidence seems good to you, whatever looks good, tastes good, feels good, but isn't of the Lord, you say, no, nah, it's, not, it's not better than Christ. It's not going to fill me like Christ does. And that's faith. Because if I'm honest, there's a lot of things out there that look good, feel good, and taste good that will satisfy me right now, or at least seem like they'll satisfy me right now. And then they'll move on, and I'll feel empty again. But the Lord, he's long-term satisfaction. And sometimes when we put our faith and trust in him, it can seem like we're not satisfied at that moment. That's why it's faith. We're trusting him to deliver on his promises. So don't be burned by the accusations, by the deceit of Satan. But there's another weapon in place. There's a minion wielding another weapon. It says, don't be seduced. 
Let's not be seduced. Verse thir- or sorry, chapter 13, verse 1. Uh, the reason why we're skipping uh, the next section is because basically it's a recapitulation. Same story, uh, just a different twist. Verse uh, 1, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads and ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear. Its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And, it had, and to it, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. And one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? So this beast is given all the power of Satan, all the power of the dragon to rule and reign on earth. And notice how the beast is an absolute mockery of the Son of God. He's the second member of this unholy Trinity, right? In chapter 19, verse 2, when Christ returns, you see that he has a name on his forehead. The beast has a bunch of blasphemous names all over him. He also has a bunch of creatures with him. He's got a leopard, a bear, his mouth is like a lion. All these sort of creatures sort of amalgamated together into one sort of super beast. This is an image of Revelation 4 or 5, right? When, when the beasts are all there worshiping before the throne, the, this is like a super beast. They're not the same beast, but it's the same image. They've been lumped together to form this monstrosity. In 1711, the beast is given a title that mocks Jesus' title, who was and is and is to come. And then probably chiefly of all, he has a mortal wound. Mortal wound is a wound that, that leads to death, right? Well, Jesus received mortal wounds. And then he came back to life. This beast has some sort of injury, some sort of an affliction. It makes it look like he's dead, but it looks like he's conquered death. It looks like he's power over death. And this has led people to worship him. He's a winner. He beat death. He's unstoppable. He can't be beaten. So rather than fight against him, let's get behind him. Let's, let's worship this guy and worship the dragon who's empowered him. Let's be on the winning side. They've been seduced by his power. And I think this is why he emerges out of the sea. In literature like this, in apocalyptic literature, which is what Revelation is, the sea can represent chaos. In fact, it often represents chaos in Scripture. So the beast emerges out of chaos, and what does he give? He gives power, he gives stability, he gives comfort, he gives strength to people who are desperate for it. And if you've been following along, this is what we traditionally call who? This is the the Antichrist. This is the Antichrist. And I think this is pointing to people of power, and I would even say by extension institutions of power, that Satan uses to persecute and oppress God's people in particular, but really just to wreak havoc and destruction on the earth, right? So throughout history, there have been a number of leaders who've been labeled the Antichrist. Probably the first one was Nero. Uh, Nero, and and, and actually some people read read this as they're talking about Nero here. Uh, Muhammad was one, widely regarded as it in, um, in the Middle Ages. The Pope, during the Reformation, was considered to be the Antichrist. Uh, Napoleon was considered to be the Antichrist. Our more modern versions of the Antichrist would be Hitler, Stalin, and whatever political president you didn't vote for, you often consider to be the Antichrist. I don't think that necessarily this has one person in mind. I think this is a reoccurring theme. Satan uses people of power, and he uses positions and institutions of power to do his work to inflict pain and punishment on the people. And that's not to say there might not be some mega antichrist coming in the future. I do know there will be one last one, because he will not be in the eternal kingdom, or she will not be in the eternal kingdom. And I think the reason why this plays out again and again and again is because power is seductive. It's seductive. We want it. We want power. We want control. We want influence. At the very least, we want to control our own life. And so even our institutions can be riddled with this sort of of corruption, right? Think about governmental systems. It's easy to point to things like Nazism or communism and say, yeah, those are totally corrupt systems. But even in our democracy, we have corruption, right? We're not immune to it. There's trials and court cases going on even as we speak with questions of corruption. Our university systems are susceptible to corruption, right? You have the Greek system, sometimes abusing pledges to the point where they actually have accidentally killed pledges. You have racism at some of them. You have a college entry scandal going on right now where celebrities use their power and wealth to get their students into schools. 
there's corruption. You have athletes that get free passes in classes so that they can play because we value a sport over integrity. You've got corporations, our corporations, filled with greed, misogyny, the devaluing of workers, and the cutting of corners. Rather than making a good product that will last a long time, like your old Nokia phone, (laughs) we're going to make something that needs an update every two years, right? The church, we're not immune to it either. We're in an institution. Been guilty of sexual abuse throughout our history. And this little thing called the Crusades that was not good. We've been focused on politics instead of the gospel because we too get seduced by power. Capitalism itself, if you follow it without any sort of moral check, it's all about getting as much as you can and throwing as many people out of your way as you can. It is susceptible to corruption. And I think this is why throughout history sexual abuse is rampant with people of power. Because whatever whatever seduction goes on in my heart when it comes to power and control, I think it's like right next door to the part of my sin nature that is tempted by sexual temptations. They're like best friends. And if you doubt this, when you read Revelation 17, 3 through 4, there's a harlot who represents the, the unrighteous. It's like the unholy church. And she's writing. There's this prostitute, and she's riding on the back of a beast. And do you know what beast she's riding on the back of? This one. Power and sex going together. If you have a lust problem, if you have a struggle with pornography or struggle with something, it might not be that you have a sex problem. You might have a power problem. You might have a lust for control and you feel frustrated in it. And I think the reason why our systems are so susceptible to these kinds of corruptions and temptations is because they are systems designed by human beings. And as human beings, guess what? We are susceptible to these kinds of temptations, this kind of corruption ourselves. Now, don't get me wrong. Power is a good thing. Power is a good thing. God is all-powerful. He is the Almighty. So power, depending on whether it's good or bad, depends on who's using it, who's wielding that kind of power. So when we manipulate, when we coerce, when we cajole people, we've given over to this lust for power, this lust for control. Because that's what power running off the rails is. It's actually idolatry. And what idols do is they give us more and more and more, or so they give us less and less and less, and demand more and more and more. Until eventually one day they give you nothing and they've taken everything from you. But what does Jesus do? Jesus, while we were still enemies, Christ died for us. So he gives us everything. He offers everything and all he asks for is faith. Now then after that, he asks for things, yes. But he asks you to trust him in faith. And that's an opportunity you have to do today. You can trust him today. But when I give in to the seduction of power and I start coercing people, cajoling people, manipulating people, passively, aggressively trying to get my way with people, the beast is no longer coming out of the sea. You know where the beast is coming out of? Me. I'm the Antichrist at that point. I'm living Antichrist in my life. Now, if you're like me, you you got to this point uh, of of, of this uh, when I was writing this, and I was like, man, it seems like everything that's good in our world is infiltrated by Satan, how do you fight this when he's in everything? Well, look at Revelation 13, 8. And all who dwell on earth will worship it, the beast, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and the faith of the saints. If corrupt power is taking and abusing people and getting what we want and making ourselves the benefit of the power, if that's what corrupt power is, then righteous power is to do the opposite. It's to be vulnerable. It's to be vulnerable. It's to, your your power as a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have two options for your power. One, lift other people up encourage other people, build them up, 
put other people into positions of influence and power, disciple, mentor, join a connect group. Maybe you don't need a connect group. That's not true. But let's say for a minute that you don't need to be in community with other people. Like, I'm good. I've got it. Well, guess what? The rest of us need you. So take your vast wisdom and knowledge that you've acquired over the ages and join us. (coughs) Encourage us. Build us up. Use your power to build other people up. That's option one. Option two, lay it aside. Don't defend yourself. Let people walk all over you. And you say, well, Travis, what about this? Let them walk all over you. Now, obviously, in cases of abuse, this is different. That is not, allowing abuse to go on is not Christ-like. You stand up and you stop that abuse from happening. Because if they're abusing you, they probably are going to abuse other people. But we do not use power and influence to harm other people or to build ourselves up. That is not Christ-like power. And if you don't, if you don't agree with me, look at how Jesus uses his power in the Gospels. What does he do? He spends a whole bunch of time walking through the Middle East, healing people, casting out demons, teaching people, instructing them. And then when it comes time for him to actually use his power to defend himself, like all of his followers wanted him to do, what does he do? He dies. He dies. Why? Because that's what real power does. It's willing to sacrifice. It's willing to lay down. So what does this look like? Husbands, love your wives to your own detriment. Wives, trust your husband, rather, trust God to lead through your husband. Students, you go to school, I'm sure, with people who are not cool, popular, fun to be around. And you might be. You might be really great. Lay aside your strength, your power, your influence, and lift up other people. All of us, let's stop manipulating, stop cajoling, stop coercing, stop being passive-aggressive, And be vulnerable human beings and use our power to the glory of God. So we're manipulated by power. We're also accused, but there's one last uh, weapon that the enemy has, and it's being tricked. Don't be tricked. So I'm going to read 11 through 18. It's fairly long, but follow along and keep in mind... Uh, the third member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, as you read this. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence, and it makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. I'm really thankful John did the math there, because I'm not a math person. I wouldn't have gotten 666, because I'm not good at math. That's the joke. This last beast emerges out of the ground, and he is a mockery. He's a, a, a mockery of the Holy Spirit. Notice what he does. He performs great signs. Fire raining down from heaven. That sounds vaguely familiar, right? Elijah also could be a reference to the descending of the tongues, the tongues of fire at Pentecost. He leads in worship of the first beast. We worship in spirit and in truth, right? He raises the first beast from the mortal wound, and that's part of his power. And then it seals those who worship the beast with his own mark, which the Holy Spirit is the seal of believers, and he marks these with a sign or a seal. Now, he's using deception. He's tricking people. He's using displays of power, all the weapons at the disposal of the beast to trick people into following the beast and the dragon. And trickery is a pretty common uh, weapon in in the toolkit of fantasy villains, right? Loki, before he was an Avenger in the the, the Norse uh, myths, was the god of mischief. He did tricks, right? Uh, Ursula in The Little Mermaid. Who is the worst? (laughs) 
She uses tricks to entrap Ariel. Why didn't she read the contract? God, did they not have lawyers under the sea? Come on. Rumpelstiltskin, again, he uses tricks to get what he wants. Greek gods, Roman gods, were well known at that time for using tricks and mischief to manipulate mortals and get what they wanted. And this would have been in the mindset, the the Roman Greek god reference, would have been in the mindset of the people reading John's letter. They've been familiar with idols and and false worship that manipulates and tricks people. And you might be sitting here today thinking to yourself, Travis, look, I'm a sophisticated person of the 21st century. I do not believe in gods or Rumpelstiltskins or I disagree with you about the Little Mermaid, whatever the case might be. (laughs) There are no sea witches, no Greek gods manipulating me. But look, you have already fallen for the deception. There's a quote that, that, that originated long before this, but I think it was made popular in the movie The Usual Suspects. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he didn't exist. Because we just ignore him. We let him go on about his business. We're like, ah, no, there's there's no such thing. There's no boogeyman out there coming to get us. And we become susceptible. Even us believers have become susceptible to taking lies, to taking myths, to taking things that sound good, and we couple them with Christianity. And we wind up with this sort of cluster of, of, of ideas and philosophies that aren't actually Christianity but just a series of philosophy and beliefs that, that, that don't really have a relationship to each other. And I think this is what the number 666 means in Scripture. Again, what's the perfect number in Revelation? What's the number that's thrown out all the time as perfection? It's seven, right? Now, there's three sixes here, one for each member of the unholy trinity, one for the dragon, one for the first beast, one for the second beast, 666. And six is so close to seven. They look good. It sounds good. It feels right. It's six. It's so close to seven. But there's a big distance between six and between seven. So here's some possible tricks that you've succumbed to, and you may not realize it. One, I need to become a better blank, so I need to work harder. Whether it's better father, better wife, better mother, better young adult, better, better Christian, whatever it is, I need to be better, so i got to work harder. Well, that, there's a place for working hard. However, you got to get rid of this pull yourself up by your bootstraps mentality because that is not the gospel of grace. That is believing the accusation because what happens when you fail to pull yourself up by your bootstraps? Then God hates you. He's disappointed in you. He's disgusted with you. And so you've bought into this lie. If I had more stuff, I'd be happier. We like to do gymnastics whenever somebody reads a passage of scripture about selling everything you have and giving it to the poor, right? Because we're like, does that actually mean I need, to, I need to make sure I don't have to give up everything? I don't think that's what those passages mean. But I do think you were called to a life as a follower of Christ of radical, sacrificial giving. Many of us live well above our means. And you are busting yourself to live in a certain neighborhood, Make sure your kids go to a certain school because your faith is in a location where you live and a school that your kids go to rather than the person and work of Jesus Christ. So we live beneath our means and give sacrificially. This is just the way I am. Deal with it. Rather than seeking to grow in the image of Christ, this is what we do. We make peace treaties with our sin. And we call them by different names. So we call abrasiveness and rudeness direct and assertive. We call greed having a head for business. We call pride self-esteem. And we hide behind personality types and little magic numbers on an Enneagram to validate the way that we are. You're like, oh, I'm an eight, so I can talk to you like you're trash. (laughs) Your number might actually actually be eight. It might be six, six, six. (laughs) Goodness. Success is winning and having more. That's another lie we buy into. You know what success is in Scripture? It's being faithful to the point of death. That's success. You win when you stick with Christ throughout your entire life. That's what success is. No matter what else happens in your life, you get laid off, you get married, you don't get married. You have a great marriage, you have a bad marriage. Guess what? Being faithful to Jesus Christ is the, it's the win. We are so consumed with what's next, with our next job, our next work, our next grade, our next school, our next step, that we're, we, we, how do we have time to minister to the people around us 
when the only thing we're ever thinking about is how soon can I move on from them to my next thing? These are just examples. There are countless others. What, what do we do to combat this? Because it's insidious. Because I buy into it too. I'm right there with you. Right there with you. I'm, a, I'm an engineer. I think I'm a five. That's the one that just wants to stay home and read all the day. Like I just, I don't want to talk to anybody. Why? Well, I'm a five. You just hide behind that. I'm right there with you. So how do we combat this? Well, Revelation 14 has some good thoughts on this. Verse one, then I looked and behold, on Mount Zion stood the lamb and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. You need to remember who you are. And you remember who you belong to. You don't have the number 666. If you're a follower of Christ, you have the name of Jesus Christ and the Father written on your heart and on your person. It's who you belong to. Who cares if the world knows who you are? Who cares if everybody else follows you on Instagram or whatever? Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe, knows who you are. And that's awesome. Join in the song of the redeemed. Verse 2. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who'd been redeemed from the earth. Learning a new song in scripture isn't just like singing, making up new music. It's also taking what is old and applying it to new situations. Your melody is a weapon coupling it. We sang this earlier, right? Good understanding scripture, understanding doctrine, taking what has been taught from ages to ages to ages, right? Joining in the song of the redeemed. That's doctrine passed down from Jesus to Augustine to Anselm to Calvin and Luther all the way to Billy Graham and Spurgeon and bam, here we are. And there are new challenges that we face every day. The world is changing. We need great theologians to rise up and help us think through, as Christians, how do I deal with this new stuff coming out? You might be sitting in this room right now. The next Charles Spurgeon, the next Billy Graham, the next Teresa of Avila might have just been dedicated right here in front of us. And if you don't think being with children is significant, it is very significant. Because if you know anything about Augustine, you know it was his mother that led him to Christ. Join with the Song of the Redeemed and take care. Disciple other people. And then we trust the Lord to keep us. Verse 4. It is those who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Look, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to buy lies. We're going to trust, we're going to believe the accusations of Satan. It's going to happen because we're human. But you trust the Lord and you hold on to him and hold fast to him, even when everything else seems to contradict. You hold fast to the Lord. Don't buy the deceptions. Don't be burned. Don't don't be seduced by power. And don't be tricked. Okay? There's a great quote. It's attributed to G.K. Chesterton, but it's actually a paraphrase. It says, fairy tales do not tell children that dragons exist. Children already know that dragons exist. Fairy tales tell children the dragons can be killed. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we give you great praise because you have thrown down the dragon. And yeah, he still causes problems down here and we are still under attack by him. But these are the death throes of a serpent without a head. And so God, I pray for each person in this room, no matter what they're going through, no matter what they're facing, no matter how just overwhelmed and oppressed they feel, God, I pray that you would, your light would pierce that darkness that they wouldn't buy into the lies, that they would not be under the the sway of the enemy any longer, and that you would set them free. No matter what it is, I pray that you would set them free. We trust you and we love you and we give you praise because you're a God who's rescued your people. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.